We work for an organisation, at least I work for an organisation called, called Langham Partnership, and I was trying to say Colin is a, has been um, a, a friend of, of Langham for a long time. And uh, we, it's a game started by John Stott. And in order for me to ramble on what Langham Partnership is, I hope there's a quick video here. Well, it's a seven minute video. Get your reading, get your reading glasses on because there's, there's no, there's, nobody speaks in this. It's all just words coming up on the screen. So we'll play that and hopefully you'll know a little bit more about Langham Partnership after that. Okay. You might notice a statement coming across up in that presentation um, that 
Every church deserves a well. They, the, um, the Americans did that. And by the way, that's the reason why it's so loud, um, because the Americans did that. But um, every church deserves a well-equipped pastor, we would say. And whenever you think about your, your church here, that you have a pastor who is equipped. He's equipped from the angle that he has resources. He has books he can go to where he can study. And if you strip all that away, you would have a very different church service here, I'll tell you here this morning. And it's heartbreaking to know that 80%, matter of fact, that's a very conservative figure. Somebody, some put it at 95% of the world's pastors have not, have not been equipped in any way to teach God's word. And whenever that happens, well then it's, it's doors open. All sorts of false teaching and false, false, um, false preaching comes in and just destroys the church. I have seen it in Zimbabwe. I have been, I was in Uganda. Um, this time last year I was in Uganda. I see it going on there. So folks, whenever you sit here, and this is the, this is the point of bringing them, we'll get into the word, that whenever you sit here on a Sunday morning, and I don't care whether there's two or 2,000 in a congregation, part of your thankfulness should be that we are in this part of the world where we're sitting under a pastor who's been equipped to teach God's word. Because we, at times we can think that that's, that is just the normal throughout the world. Whenever actually what we're doing here is actually the exception. It's the exception. Is that because most of the world, uh, most of the worship services that will go on today will not be sitting under a pastor who has been equipped to teach God's word. That's what we're about. And that's what we seek to do. Okay, let's get into God's word. Um, and uh, hopefully your passage will not be too hard to find because it's Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to read four or five verses from the, or the first four or five verses. And then we're going to slip on to verse 26. Um, if you're looking for a heading of today, of the sermon today, it is playing my parts in God's mission. Playing my part in God's mission. Okay, I know that whenever I was chatting with, with your pastor, that he is real hard to reach into this part of the community. And, and um, therefore, I thought this might be uh, a, applicable for today. So, Genesis chapter 1, I'm reading from, from the NIV. I, I forgot to ask what, past, what you read from, but however, we're reading from the NIV, okay? At least, at least I am. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the, suffer, the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. That's, the, that's a theme now that starts to flow through Scripture, that light is good. Okay? And he separated light from the darkness. Notice he doesn't call the darkness good. And God called light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning in the first day. Slip on to verse 26, and God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let him, be, and let him rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Um... And the livestock over the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. Again, another important thing to consider. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Is it not, is it not different to this world today? Male and female, he created them. And this whole, well, that's a, that's a sermon for another day. Um, um, God, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the ground. Then God said, I've give you, given you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, um, everything that has breath and life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that he, all that he'd made, that it was very good. Very good. And it was evening and there was morning and the sixth day. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to our God. Could we just have a word of prayer? 
uh, more for me than for anybody else as we look at this passage. Heavenly Father, what we don't know, we pray that you will teach us. What we are not, we pray that you will make us. And Lord, we pray that we don't have that you will give us for our sake, but more importantly, for the glory of your Son. In your name we ask it. Amen. And amen. I wonder, have you ever considered who the first missionary in the Bible was? Well, I guess in order to answer that question, we really need to define what this word missionary is. Well, this word missionary comes from the word, uh, a Latin word, missio. Um, now, I must, must tell you here, I was mentioning this in a, in a sermon I was doing in Dublin a few weeks ago. Unknown to me that there was a professor of Latin that was sitting in the congregation. So that was a leveler for, for Armstrong. Um, but this word, it comes from this word, missio, which means to send on a task. Therefore, the word missionary displays the effort, an effort somebody makes in order to do a task. And although the word missionary as itself is not in the Bible, in its most, bef- in its most bef- basic form, Christians use the word mis- missionary to describe someone who is sent on the task to communicate who God is. So in its most basic form, a missionary is someone who is sent on a task to communicate who God is. So back to our original question. Who was the first missionary in the Bible who was sent to communicate who God is? Well, we get the answer to that question in the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. Because whenever we read the words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, God was stating that he's going on a mission. If you like, God is sending himself to be a missionary, where where his mission was to tenderly create the heavens and the earth that he would care and that he would value. And in turn, creation would communicate back to him how great he is, would communicate back to God the greatness of God. Now, as we move on in the creation story, We see that the pinnacle of God's creation mission um, was to create humanity. And in verse 26, on the sixth day of creation, the Godhead here seems to be pausing. They seem to be almost contemplating as they're they're considering, let us make man in our, our own image. Let us make man in our likeness. Now, we don't see that comment in any other of in any of the other days of creation. And I think the comment is made because humanity would have a special place in God's creation. A special place where our first parents would have the capacity to consciously and thoughtfully respond to God's care for them and his value of them. And in response to the loving, caring creator God, humanity then would have the ability to offer thoughtful, and conscious, God-centered worship to their creator. That is what we've been at this morning. We've been offering thoughtful, I hope we were thinking about what we were doing, as well as as being conscious, we know what we're doing, and that it has been God-centered worship uh, 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 um, to, to our creator. Now, what a beautiful and comforting image Genesis 1 is. Where God is on this mission, where he's creating the heavens and the earth, and where humanity, where humanity is valued as the high point of his, of his creation, and in response, humanity has this ability to consciously worship the God who values them. What a comforting picture this is for the individual who parents say that they were nothing more than a mistake in the relationship. And really, they didn't expect the the child to actually exist in the world. They might have been surprised to their parents, but God values them. What a comfort Genesis 1 is to the individual who suffered abuse from the very people who should have been protecting them. In their pain, God values them. What a comfort to the immigrant who has had to leave their home country because of poverty, political pressure, or persecution, where at times their adopted country is less than welcoming. In their dislocation, 
God values them. What a comfort Genesis 1 is to you and me in our hardship. We're in, we're in spite of the question which we can ask at times, God, why are you letting this happen? And let me say to you, it is okay to ask that question. It is okay. God can handle our why questions. He's big enough to handle that. And indeed, whenever we look throughout Scripture, we see time and time again these men and women of God who ask God, why? Why are you letting this happen to us? Indeed, the book of Psalms that we can so often is God's song, song book in the Bible, that there's actually more what we call lament psalms. Psalms that start with the why God? Why God are you doing this? There's more lament psalms than there are pure worship psalms in the Bible. So it's okay to ask the why question. Redburn, can I say to you, and it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm stepping, stepping myself out of it's okay to ask that question this morning. Even despite of the letter. It's okay. It's okay to come before God and ask, why? Because in the plan, in God's plan for your life and for mine and for Redburn at this particular time, God isn't playing some sort of silly, silly games with you. No, no, you're too precious to him for him to be doing that. Therefore, let me tell you, there is a reason for the pain in which we experience. God lets it happen, and lets the pain happen, because there's a reason for it. He's just not bored with us and playing games with us. And therefore, therefore Genesis 1 brings us back to that point, that God values us and cares for us. The next reflection of the missional God in action is, if you like, diametrically opposite to the beautiful scene in Genesis 1. Because in Genesis 3, we see that God is making this, making the conscious and thoughtful decision, because, sorry, because humanity is making a thoughtful and conscious decision to reject God's value and care for them. Where in chapter 3, verse 4, the, the, the statement by the serpent, you shall be like God's, was more satisfying to our first parents than God's value of them. Where they now sought to value themselves as the supreme thing in their lives. So that the worship of God was now superseded by the worship of themselves. And in, in response to this rebellion against God, and in order to protect his dignity, his holiness, his justice, and his majesty, God engages in the missional act of sending them out of the Garden of Eden. For humanity would now experience two deaths. The first death was immediate, where the unique bond between God and humanity died, and the second death being slower, where from that day humanity began to literally feed their age where pain and eventual, eventual death was now on the horizon. Now, there's an important point here. If we're going to engage in mission, and if we're going to be missional people, and if we're going to be evangelizing people, we have to declare that the perfect God displays perfect justice. That people will not get away with rebelling against God. That is the bad news. In the, in, the, in the gospel. That's, the new, that's what was being stated in the statement in which Colin gave uh, a few minutes ago. Man does not get away with it. Man does not have the last say. God always wins. God will always respond. And therefore the perfect God will, all, will, will, will administer his perfect justice. And that's what we see happening in chapter, in chapter 3. Well, as we work through our Bibles, and we're not going to do a, a, a chapter by chapter through the Bible, um, um, even though, even though uh, uh, Colin gave me, that's very dangerous, Colin says, just take as, just be as long as you take. So it is, that's dangerous ground, dangerous ground. Okay, so as we work through our Bibles, from that day, from Genesis 3 to Genesis 11, we see the, the outworking of humanity's rebellion against God. In Genesis 4, we see the effect of sin on the family. 
where a brother kills a brother out of jealousy. In Genesis 6 to 8, we see sin's effect on society, where it's now becoming totally corrupt, where God has to step in. In Genesis 11, we see sin's effect on worship through the Tower of Babel, where the building of the tower uh, was, was, was in order so that people could... Uh, the building of the tower was, was so that people, so that the building of the tower would reflect to the people themselves how, their own achievements. And the reason why they were, they were wanting to reflect back to themselves their own achievements was, there, was that there was now a presumption that they actually were gods. That they didn't need anything outside of themselves. And really not much has changed from Genesis 3 to 11. Where the dismantling of family, the corrupting of society... And the celebration of man's achievements is woven into the fabric of fallen humanity, where for fallen humanity now, wants, now just wants to worship themselves. Where rebellion against God continues right to this day with the declaration we do not need or we don't want God. The Bible summarizes the rebellion of humanity in Isaiah 53 very clearly where it says, we all like sheep. And by the way, coming from a slight farming background, you know, whenever the Bible talks to us about being sheep, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a compliment he's making. But we can think ourselves like fluffy little lambs and that I love. There's nothing more stupider than a sheep, let me tell you. Whenever you even look at them, you know, the big body, four spindly legs, when they fall over, they can't even get back up again. So whenever the Bible talks about us being sheep, it by no means is it a compliment in any way. But the Bible says, we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own rebellious against God way. We've all gone our own way. Whenever it comes to the core of it, we all want to be gods of our own lives. Therefore, following the law of of Genesis 11, we come to Genesis 12. See, I want the school. 12, 12, 12 follows 11. I'm, I'm no good too. But, uh, but uh, God, but uh, where we see that God doesn't leave this situation in limbo. But we now see God actively on a mission. On a mission where he's going to restate humanity back into a relationship with himself. Where God is going to work. If you like, God was going to partner with humanity in mission to redeem humanity. And this partnership commences in Genesis 12, where we're introduced to this man called Abraham, who's described in Hebrews 11 as a man of faith. If you like, he's, he was a man whose value was found in God. A man who was countercultural to the community around him. Where although his kinsmen worshipped multiple gods, Abraham worshipped Yahweh, the one true living God. He worshipped the one God. And as we trace God in his mission engaging with Abraham, and we want to be, I use a big theological term in there, it's called the Abrahamic Covenant. We see God's blessing Abraham in three ways. First of all, his descendants would become a nation, even at this point where he had no family. Secondly, they would have their own land. Again, land now starts to become a central theme throughout Scripture. And where God declares the great mission statement, where Abraham's descendants would be the instruments through whom God would communicate who he is to all the other nations of the earth, where he states, where all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And as we continue through the rest of the Old Testament... We see God continuing on his mission through Abraham's descendants. We call them the Israelites. Where through the highs and the lows, the good and the bad, the faithful and the disobedient, the, the children of the missional God continues to move forward to prove and to make good his covenant with Abraham. The Apostle Paul affirms God keeping his mission covenant with Abraham whenever he states in Galatians 4, 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth a son. Remember where the son came from? Came from the descendant of Abraham. God making good his promise. 
born of a woman, born under the law, in other words, humanity, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might be received the adoption of sons. We're a human descendant of Abraham was born that we might, where we could get to know God in a new way. Where rebellious humanity, if you like, could have their relationship with their creator restored and live for the reason why they were created. Because we've all been created for one reason. We've all been created to worship God. So God, on his mission, would send his son who would enter this world just like you and me, who would be part of a family just like you and me, who would live, love, laugh, and cry just like you and me, but unlike you and me where our focus is on making gods of ourselves. His focus was totally on God the Father. In John 5.30, the son declares, I seek not my will, but the will of my Father who sent me. So when Jesus, the God-man, came to earth, he became the proof of the missional God on earth when he dwelt amongst us. Where, if you like, where we we were able now to see God's mission plan now in the flesh whenever Jesus came. And that missional plan where Jesus would become the perfect one-off, one-time sacrifice, as we've just remembered a few moments ago, who would pay the price that our sin and rebellion demanded, where he would bear our sin in his body in a Roman, in, on a Roman instrument of torture. The hymn writer really sets it so well whenever he says this, and I think I must be getting old, matter of fact, I'm getting old, because I'm going back to the old hymns. <laughs> so uh, hymns that I didn't appreciate whenever I was growing up. I'm sort of going back and visiting them again, but, and here's one, but it fits it so well. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, In my place condemned, he stood and he sealed my pardon with his blood. And the only response we can have back to that is hallelujah. What a saviour. Where through Jesus' incarnation, life, death, resurrection and ascension, he opened the way where you and I could have our sins forgiven and the relationship that was broken in the Garden of Eden restored. This year, 2024, it is estimated that 63.5 million people will come to the cross with their brokenness and seek forgiveness from the tender, merciful God who values them, where he values them to the point that he went on a mission to bring people back into a relationship with him, with himself. 63.5 million is estimate. That's more than the whole population of the whole K, of the whole UK. Leads me to stop here and to ask the question, and I don't know any of you apart from two. I wonder if you've been to this place. I wonder have you been to the place where you've realized the futility of your own ends, your own goals, your own gods. We have come to realize that for you, Life does not have any real purpose or any real meaning. And it doesn't matter how high you get up the ladder of success or whatever. All you're ever met with is is emptiness. Where nothing you planned has turned out what you imagined it it would be. And today you've realized that your life without Christ is nothing but shattered dreams. Well, today I invite you to come to the place... Put your trust in the one who's gone on a mission to offer you life. That mission that involved the death and resurrection of Jesus to give you to give you meaning and purpose and direction. The one who paid the price for your sin calls you through 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 Matthew eleven twenty eight. It says, "Come to me, all you who are weary and overburdened, and I will give you rest." Put my yoke and learn of me. The one who brings such comfort by saying, I am gentle and humble of heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Will you come? 
For us who have come to that place in our lives where our relationship with our Creator has been restored, where we've been given eternal life and are now new creations, as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 5, my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. In our new identity, we've taken on the name of Jesus Christ. We are now Christians, Christ ones, one belonging to Christ. That's what the word Christian means. The word Christian means one belonging to Christ. And therefore, we're part of a global movement called, called the church. The global church that is made up both of those who have passed from this earth and have already seen Jesus face to face, along with us who are, who are waiting to see Jesus face to face. Now, for the global church that is here on earth and are waiting to see Jesus face to face, our commitment at this time is to follow Jesus Christ. And if our global church is, is to be committed to following Jesus Christ, then there's a, a requirement to obey his commands. Because whenever the church follows the commands of our Savior, it is engaging in God's mission and revealing to the world who Jesus is. In other words, whenever the church is obedient to Christ, it paints to the world who Jesus Christ is. Why? Because as Paul said earlier, as I said earlier in Galatians 4, we are God's ambassadors. We are the representatives on earth. And this is seen in, in, in Jesus' command, I think, right at the commencement of the church. Right in day one of the church in Acts 1, where there's this command to, to partner with him in his mission and declaring in who he, in who he is. Where in Acts 1.8 we are to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to, uh, to the ends of the earth. I was thinking about that as I was coming up the road. If that, if that had been said, oh, obviously that was said in Jerusalem, but if that was said in Hollywood, it'd be saying, you're to be witnesses in Hollywood in North Down, in the, oh, sorry, in Hollywood, in Northern Ireland, in the UK, and to the rest of the earth. And this command that was given on day one of the New Testament church is still alive today. And has come down through church history and through the pains of church history. And if you don't read church history, read a, read a little bit of church history. Because you, it will open your eyes to the pain of which people said. Where I, I'm going to give you one, one example. I've just, realized, I've just realized that that clock's not working. That's great. So uh, where, where just, uh, where, um, where, um, I'll just give you one example. Jan Hus, where in 1413, he, he, he was burned at the stake for declaring uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. And as Jan Hus Hus burned at the stake, he made the declaration that within a hundred years, that there, his, actually his words was, they have, co they, have, they have cooked the goose today because Hus, in his home Bolivian language, uh, means goose. So he says, you have cooked the goose today. But within a hundred years, there will be a swan that will rise in which you will not be able to stop. And exactly a hundred years later, John Calvin was born. And John Calvin, uh, the, 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 the family plinth, for want of a better word, of the Calvin family is that of a swan. And therefore, when it's good to read church history because you hear of the pain in which people did defending the gospel uh, and the persecution in which they went through. And therefore, all through church history, there, there has been this command to, to engage with the missional God to where it's come right down to where it impacts Redburn Community Church on the 21st of January, 2024. Where at this point and at this time, the command of Jesus is resting on this church to be engaged in and partnering with God in his mission to tell who he is. Why? Why? Because it's estimated that there's 7.014 billion people in the world who are not followers of Jesus Christ. 
So let's drill into that a little bit more. As an individual, if we have taken on the name of Christ because we've been redeemed by his, by his precious blood, where Christ through his Holy Spirit now dwells within us, individually we are part of the global church through the local church where it is our individual responsibility to pick up the mission baton and to run with the covenant that God made with Abraham that he wants to bless all the nations of the earth. So if we say that we are a Christian, we are then also a missionary. Folks, you can't split the term. If we are a Christian, we are also a missionary. If we say we love Jesus then we as Christians are to be involved in communicating who Jesus is. There's no getting out of that. Or if I could put it on a, a negative way, disobeying the command of Jesus isn't just simply neglecting this command. It's actually denying who we are in Christ. Therefore, our individual responsibility to mission is not, should I be a missionary? <laughs> But where should I be a missionary? That statement, I think, needs some clarification because you might be panicking at this point. Oh, no, he's sending us to Africa. So, yes. Um, but stay with me. I think that one of the great tragedies today in the church, I'm speaking generally, I'm speaking, talking about the church generally, especially in the West, when it comes to mission, is that we somehow have limited the scope of mission. Where missionaries are generally referred to as those who have left their own people on their own shores and have moved to foreign lands with a vision to share the good news of Jesus in foreign lands. And of course we need people to do that. Or they're seen as people who have left some type of secular role and are committed to serve in some sort of full-time capacity. And again, we need people to do that. Are there professionals who have received some specific training and have been commissioned by the church? And yes, there absolutely is a place for that in the church. Engagement and mission may involve going to other lands where God has placed a people or a land or a continent on someone's heart. And if God has called you to do that, you must go. Let me tell you of my friend Jim, who's in Luganda at the minute. Jim was, professed, Jim was a project manager, um, did very well in his life. At 60 years of age, God called Jim to Uganda, and there he's serving in Uganda. I spent, Jim, Jim's actually from Bangor, so he is, and there he's serving Christ in Uganda. He's now, he's now 82 years of age. Don't say you're too old. Okay. But at the heart of mission, there needs to be a willingness to share who Jesus is with the gifts in which he has given us within the location he has placed us. That is really important, so I'm going to say it again. At the heart of mission, there needs to be a willingness to share who Jesus is with the gifts he has given us within the location he has placed us. So how do you see yourself when it comes to partnering with God in mission? Do you see yourself as a student who's a Christian or a businessman who's a Christian or a nurse who's a Christian or whatever you are? Mommy. Where somehow, and this is where the danger is, where we've siloed ourselves into different areas in our life, where there's our professional life, there's our home life, and there's our church life, and one never impedes the other. Or are you a Christian student? Christian businessman, a Christian nurse, or, or whatever. Well, your desire to serve Jesus permeates into every area of your life. Where you see the place that God has called you currently, and where you're exercising your gifts presently, is more than just simply getting an education or a living, important as that is. But you see that God has you there for a purpose. That God has you there to be a missionary. It doesn't mean that we're constantly preaching around the watercolour or whatever. Uh, sometimes people can make a nuisance of themselves doing that every day. But it does mean that we live our lives in the light that we're representing Jesus. 
a life that is counter-cultural to those around us. Because when we live our lives obeying Jesus' command to go into all the world, the world notices it. People generally don't tell Christians whenever they're living right. They certainly tell us whenever we get it wrong. However, if we're willing to take on the mantle of mission into our individual situations, the time will come whenever somebody will notice. And from my experience, that has been whenever something has happened individually to us. And people, the world expects us to react some way, but actually we react another way. Um, I think of a friend of mine who was overlooked in, in, for promotion. And simply it was, it was because they were Christians. There, no, there was no two ways about it. And, and unions were, went off, you get in you fight your corner, and you do all this, and you know, you're not right now. And just said, it's God's will. It's God's will. Now I'm saying you are quiet all the time. But for his situation, it was like that. And as a result of that, and somebody turned around, and this is what usually happens. Someone will then ask the question, well, why are you responding that way? What is it that makes you different? And whenever that question's open, man, you can drive a bus through that door. Where we can say, tell them of a friend who meets us, who sticks closer than a brother. And we would love to introduce them to that friend too. There is a role for you in mission. It may be here, it may be over there, it may be front line, maybe behind the scenes role. Some are called to go to the other side of the world. Some are called to go to the other side of the street. Some are called to go to the other side of the room. Some are called to engage in people facing roles like standing behind a pulpit. Some play a, back, a, a more backroom role. But here's the point. If it's done for the glory of God, it is all mission. It is all mission. He's on mission at the minute. Work on a computer. He's on mission this morning playing a, playing, playing a piano. The one who set this room up it was on mission. I, mean, I, don't even, I don't know who it was because it set up when it came in. It's all mission whenever it's done for the glory of God. In 1793, Andrew Fuller was talking to his friend who's about to go on board a ship to go and be a missionary in India. And in those days, going on foreign mission, it simply meant that you weren't never coming back. As a matter of fact, there was a high likelihood that you would actually die on the journey, die on the ship on the way there, and you would never get to your destination. But as they talked, Fuller com commented to his friend, William Carey, who became known as the, as the father of modern mission, that it seemed to him that India was like a deep, unexplored mine. Now, I need to explain that a little bit. Whenever somebody was going down a new mine, they would tie a rope around the individual so the person on the surface level would be the support. So if something went wrong, they obviously would get him back out, and that's what's getting at. And India was like a deep, unexplored mine. And Kerry's response back to, to Fuller was, well, I'll go down the mine, but I need you to hold the rope. And Fuller's uh, reply back to Kerry promised that he would hold the rope for as long as he lived. And that is what engaging in mission is all about. Some of us are called to go down the mine. Some of us have a frontline role. Some are called to go overseas and tell the good news of Jesus or whatever. While others are called to hold the rope of prayer and support. And as I have thought about that, and I've thought about that statement, I'll go down the mine, but I need you to hold the rope. I've come to this conclusion that both roles are equally important. One can't happen without the other. The rope holder is no less important than the one down the mine. It's all needed. You're needed. You're needed to play your part in God's mission, to partner with him in building a people from every tribe and tongue and nation who someday will join the, the worshipping around the, around the throne where we will worship the Lamb who's on the throne. So as I finish here, I wonder what your role in mission is. What is your role in communicating who God is? Because there's a work for Jesus ready at your hand. Tis the task the master for you has planned. He has to do his bidding. Yield him service true. There is a work for Jesus for you to do. 
There's a work for Jesus, humble though it be. Tis the very service he would ask of thee. Go where the fields are white and, and the laborers few. White city. <laughs> There's a work for Jesus for you to do. There's a work for Jesus, precious souls to bring. Tell him of your mercies. Tell him of your king. Faint not, nor grow weary, folks. His strength will renew. There is a work for Jesus for you to do. To work for Jesus day by day. Serve him ever, falter, never Christ obey. Yield him service that's loyal and that's true. It's a work for Jesus, for you to do. May God give us the vision and the desire to mission where he would have us be. Amen.